Can everybody see my screen? Can you give me a thumbs up if you can see my screen? Yes. Okay. Perfect. Awesome. All right. So let's get started. So welcome to pipelines for everyone pipelines for all from data, data engineering to machine learning. What we're going to be talking about today and what we're going to be covering is how do we create pipelines or and automate these pipelines to make useful things for us. I'm assuming everyone in this in this workshop is either a data professional um, of some kind or wants to be a data professional of some kind and you have some sort of background in programming. So whether it's in IT uh, of some of some sort or um, in business intelligence or uh, whatever, you have had some experience and some exposure uh, to either Python or data or both. And what we're going to learn today about is, OK, so how do we create the useful pipelines and automate and automate them? so that we can continue using them later on and also to, to, to save ourselves time. But we're going to talk more about that here in just a second. So the first thing you need to know is you need to go to the repo that I put in the in the chat. I'm going to put it one more time just in case. Uh, and then once you get to that repo, you don't really need to do anything other than click on this button where it says launch binder. That is, that is where we are, what we are all going to use for the session. We're all going to use Binder for the session, but then um, after the session, you can always come back and download the repo. Or you can download the repo if you like right now and set up the environment. There are, um, uh, there are instructions on how to do that, but what I would prefer is if we all, for the purpose of this tutorial, use Binder um, to do our work. Now, when binder opens up if you have never used it before you have to keep in mind that um you have to at least run a cell or do some do something do some kind of operation uh between within 10 minutes otherwise it goes stale and then you have to refresh binder okay so what we're going to do is after all of you um click open up uh, a binder session on the tab uh, open up a new tab with that binder session It's going to take a second to download. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to start going over the um, going over the few slides that I have here to motivate this talk. So uh, first off, uh, welcome everyone to pipelines for all. Um, this has been um, this talk or in tutorial is sort of inspired um, on the many data projects in which I have participated, which brings me to who I am. My name is Ramon. Um, I live in Sydney. I work as a senior product developer at a company called Decoded. And what we do is that we provide education for the masses, whether it is in um, giving you a new mindset, a new, um, a new set of tools on how to think about data and data literacy and or how to become data literate to helping you acquire the skills necessary to become a data professional from data analyst to data to full fledged data scientist. Um, and there I work in the, in, um, in the products that we provide companies. So we do this for organizations, not for um, individuals. So or not for um, like students that are kind of at an academic institution. So it is a business. So that's what I do. Um, I have been working as a data science educator, researcher, um, and yeah, researcher and data science, uh, data scientist and data science educator for the past five years. And yeah. I am very excited to bring you uh, to bring you this talk today. So what are we going to talk about? Uh, I'm going to give you a short and quick scenario to motivate uh, the talk and the topic that we're going to be covering. Then I'm going to tell you what are pipelines in a broad sense and in a very individualistic se uh, sense. And then third, I'm going to tell you why should you care about pipelines? And then we're going to jump into the hands on tutorial. Remember, the all of the uh, the presentation and everything that we're going to use is within this repository so you can download it at the top or you can clone it or you can uh, launch the binder session so remember the binder session is going to take a little bit to open up so make sure you open up this session in a new tab and of course if any questions come up as we go through the tutorial please let me know i am um, i have the chat on my right hand side 
and I'm watching it all the time. So yeah, just let me know if you have any questions. So let's get started. All right, so scenario and motivation for this talk. As a data analyst, think about yourself if you were as a, uh, a data analyst. And um, have you ever found yourself in this particular scenario? Imagine you have um, data in a database or in different data sources with information regarding bike sharing system. A bike sharing system is a particular system that gets placed in a city or in, a, um, in an urban location whereby you can go to a station um, located in strategic places around the city and rent a bike. You rent a bike with your uh, credit card and it usually either charges you by the hour, uh, by the half hour, or you pay by, uh, for a particular amount of time for which you want to rent it. And if you go over, you get charged an excess uh, amount. So anyway, so we have that kind of information and you have been asked to derive some insights from that data set. Your process usually goes as follows. You have to locate the data. Okay, where do we have it at the company or where did the client, how did the client give us that data? What was the format that the client used to give us this particular data set? Um, then you write, if it's in a database or if a data engineer got access to that data set and put it in a database, you will have to write a short SQL query to, re to retrieve that data and manipulate it. Then the next thing you know, you're gonna throw it into a notebook, um, you're gonna throw it at Tableau, or your favorite business intelligence tool of choice to find some insights. And that's how you go through your process. So let's put this into perspective. So you have the data. So imagine I already downloaded it um, or I know where it's at and I have this particular kind of data. I have a timestamp, the count of bikes, uh, temperature, humidity, wind speed, blah, 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 and all of that. Then the next thing is that you write a query and you try to select all of the row, all of the columns, all of the rows from your table, and you order it by date because you know you have dates um, and times at which a particular amount of bikes was rented in the city of London. So the next thing you know is that you know maybe instead of opening up a Jupyter notebook, you open up a, a spreadsheet, and then for in that spreadsheet you put put in your data, whether it's Google Sheets, Microsoft Excel, or whatever. You put in your data and you start um, creating some functions and doing some analysis, cleaning it, whatever. Then after you clean it, you put it into your favorite BI tool or visualization tool, something like Tableau. And then you start making visualizations and reports that you can share with other people so that they can see, um, they can see the insights that you uncover. Uh, then after that, your next step is or and then, and then you're done. You share it with other people at your organization, either in your team um, or within another team or to your boss or whoever. You share it with somebody or you share it with the world. So those are, let's say, um, in a very abstract way and simpli uh, simplistic way, those are four steps that might be part of your process, might be part of your pipeline. So then what if you had one tool or one full process that allowed you to put all those steps into one single step? What if you have just one that can give you everything you need, you need it? And say, for example, this tool is Pandas. You're reading a SQL query with Pandas. You're taking from that table. You're ordering by the timestamp. You are piping a function, some sort of function that you created that is going to clean your data set. And then at the end, you are plotting the timestamp versus the count of bikes and rotating the, um, the access label so that you can see it a little bit better. So imagine, so we just went through four steps to be able to write a SQL query, uh, um, locate the data, write a SQL query, manipulate it in some way, and then visualize it. And now we just put four steps into essentially two lines of code. And arguably, it could be just one line of code. But of course, here we have a connection. That's something that has to, that has to happen, but that's also one more line. So the idea is that a pipeline is a process by which you can assign steps or of loading, manipulating, extracting, doing something and visualizing data through one line of code or several lines of code. Save yourself some time, save yourself some, um, uh, I don't know, or give yourself more time to think about, uh, about the problems at the company. So now that, we, now that we see these, and that is just one tool, so what are pipelines? So a pipeline is a process used to run among many things, data or other pieces of information through, through a series of steps. If you load data 
to do something with it, that is a pipeline. If you were just loading data for the sake of looking at it, just, just staring at it, then that might just be one step. But if you loaded the data and you did one thing to it or two things to it, you are creating a pipeline. And of course, pipelines can be of many kinds and many forms. A pipeline can be something that takes water from point A to B, but it is a flow of something. And the same happens with data. It's a flow or something. It's a flow of data from one point to another, or it's the flow of some processing from one step to another. Okay, the binder should almost should be should be done soon. So remember to hit binder and open it up in a new tab if you haven't yet. All right. So now that we know what a pipeline is, so many professionals build data pipelines for a living. Let's talk about those data professionals that use pipeline or that build pipelines for a living. So the first one is data engineers. So usually data engineers start or I would say um, without much uh, in-depth knowledge of this, I would say data engineer has been a practice and has been a job title that has been available maybe for four or five years. But the practice of doing data engineering, building pipelines that, that manipulate, transform, and load data, take data from one place, manipulate it and transform it, put it in some other place, that has been going on for quite a while. I don't have the exact date, but you can think of this process as you have some databases on the left, you have some sort of transformation pipelines or functions in your favorite programming language or whatever you want to use, and then you have to load it into a new database or into an analytical warehouse where your analysts, your data scientists, your machine learning engineers can access that data and then do something useful with it. So usually they worry, data engineers worry about the movement and transformation of data for the ease of use. Another common pattern nowadays is the ELT. ELT is take all of the data that you can find that you need from one place, aggregate it in some sort of way and, and or load it in some sort of place where you have everything you need and then transform it in a series of steps. And the reason for this is that the, it might just be easier to have everything you need from multiple data sources in one place rather than transform everything um, up front if you don't necessarily need to transform it right away, if you only need to see a piece of that data. So there's many reasons and many caveats as to why you want to do one versus the other, but they are both very popular. And if I had to take a guess, ETL or extract, transform and load is the most popular one right now, or the one most commonly used, the one that you will find most often. And also the one we're going to build today. All right, the second, the second data professional that you might see building pipelines all the time is a data analyst. A data analyst takes some data from a warehouse, from a SQL query, writes a SQL query, takes some data, puts it into a spreadsheet like we saw a second ago, and then creates a dashboard, a visualization, something by which, uh, with which you could tell a story, something with which you could say something to somebody else, provide an insight, provide or help in making a decision to a decision maker, to a stakeholder. So data analysts, they automate the ingestion of, the ingestion of data, the creation of visualizations, and the consumption of insights through reports and dashboards. The next one that we have on our pipeline is DevOps engineers. DevOps engineers, they create robust pipelines that test, inspect, verify, and deploy entire systems and infrastructures. What does that mean? That means that an, an entire website, and not just a website, um, an entire uh, processing or the infrastructure of a company, of a tool, of a system, of a piece of software, might depend, depend on the process created by a DevOps. What does that process look like? Create automated tests or unit tests for your functions, for your programs, for your pieces of code. Everything has to go through something called CI, continuous integration. Continuous integration makes sure that every piece of code that we have written, if it has a purpose, it has a test. If it has a test, it needs to pass before it gets merged into a master branch that hits the world, that shows the world our product. Then the next one is continuous, continuous deployment or continuous, uh, continuous development which is whereby if your test passed, then you push those changes either to the master branch or to a, what they call a green branch, which is a branch that goes into a shadow deployment or some sort of canary deployment, which essentially means 30% um, of our um, incoming traffic will see, or 20% of our incoming traffic will see the changes that we just did to this website and blah, blah, blah. So DevOps, um, they are the giants on which shoulders we all stand on. Uh, let's check on Binder very quickly. It should be opening up soon, Binder. If anyone opens, okay, now it should be opening. So if you get to open Binder, please let me know. 
once it opens for you, uh, give me a thumbs up once Binder opens for you. Okay, so the next one is um, data scientists. So data scientists, they create experiments and models that depend on specific engineering steps, not provided in the transformation part of an ETL pipeline. What does that mean? That means that, yes, uh, the data engineer transformed and loaded the data into a warehouse that everybody can use and access, but the data scientists might need to create more clever feature, features with um, a particular purpose. For example, if, in the, if the warehouse is a non-SQL database or whatever, and it has images, maybe those images have to be transformed, resized, or restructured in some sort of way before they can be processed um, through a modeling pipeline. And that is something that the data scientists will do. So the output of these pipelines can be a product, a decision, or an idea. And then lastly, uh, we have, it's done? Okay, perfect, awesome. Let me know everyone whenever you have Jupyter Lab running. And then the last one is the machine learning engineers or the MLOps. So what do they do? They create robust systems that train, save, deploy, and monitor machine learning models. So if you have something providing you with a, a continuous decision or a continuous, say, set of prices for a supermarket chain or for a retailer or um, a model that predicts churn, well, the behavior of people that are about to be changed, that, that are about to leave your business or your subscription might change over time. So I might go to your website to see news, um, to see comments, to see tweets, to see whatnot. But then I might be just going to your website because I like the videos or I like um, the design of your website and I wanted to see something else. If I start switching from one, from one usage to another and that, that other usage um, diminishes with time, then I have changed my behavior and I'm also providing a piece of information to a model as to why I might churn. And the idea behind it is that people's, the data will change over time, so it has to be monitored. And this is something that falls into the shoulders of machine learning engineers and MLOps people. Okay, so now the last thing, why should you care? So, well, when you have to load, clean a bed, and then do something useful, you are creating a pipeline. It doesn't matter what it is. Hence, any process involving one or more steps can be considered to, um, by which you do something with data can be considered a pipeline. And as such, it should be treated as one. Why? Automating the steps of your pipeline can save you time, money, and other resources. These steps, it can also uh, allow you to create robust tests around your pipelines. Not only DevOps need to create tests, also data scientists, um, data analysts, um, and machine learning engineers should all, machine learning engineers more than the other, than the latter two, but certainly than the former two, but certainly the former two should also create their tests and, and make sure their code is reproducible. And then which takes us to the next, to the third step, it increases reproducibility, reproducibility and consistency of our work. Last one, it, ena it, enable, it enables um, data professionals across organizations to work on different tasks. So if you create a pipeline and automate a process that you don't need to recreate at another point in time, then you have more time in your hands to do something different and maybe create more value for your company, work on designing more models or creating more models and something else. All right, so now it's time for a hands-on tutorial. So um, thank you for listening to me there. Now let's get to the tutorial. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna navigate, and let me make this a little bit bigger. We're gonna navigate to the notebooks. And then in the notebooks, oh, so remember the presentation that I just walked through with you is right over here. So you will always have access to it. Uh, okay, so open up 01 underscore ETL underscore pipes and that's the first that's the first place where we're going to start all right so i always like to um start my lessons and start tutorials with like a quote that i don't know puts me in the right mindset for or, or gives me like some sort of insight as to what i'm about to do so i love this one by donato diorio who i don't know who it is but i love the quote without a systematic way to start and keep data clean bad data will happen and I, and I firmly believe that. I also put a nice picture here of what a pipeline will look like. You have a process, for example. I talked about churn earlier. So landing page, a person goes through a login process, new user, register, subscription plan, um, buys a ticket, um, class search, map, confirmation, ticket, and so forth. So all of those processes, we might not need all of those. And in a transformation pipeline, some of this might get taken out of it because they are not um conducive to something useful for analysis maybe 
like if it's the, the pattern of uh, a law or something like that. Anyways, so the learning outcomes. By the end of this session, I hope you understand better why we need to move data from one point to another um, to the same at the same time and that we clean it. I hope you understand how to combine data from different uh, sources, um, have the knowledge of how to create your own data pipelines with Python, um, learn a little more about manipulating and mold your data in the way you need it to be, and understand how to visualize the pipelines you create to help you with their development. Um, all right, so what we're going to cover here, what are the pipelines, which we just talked about. So I might just um, continue on um, for a little bit uh, or just skip this part or go very fast through this uh, step. The tools for the session, our case for this workshop, the data. Um, then we're going to go into small pipes with uh, pandas. Then we're going to do the extract, transform, and load parts, launch the pipeline, automate it, and then work through a summary, and then we'll go to the machine learning pipeline. So. Um, something that I haven't mentioned, um, the tutorial itself looks like this. First, we're going to talk about what's the presentation, but now we're going to talk about data engineering. In about 20 minutes, we'll go on a seven minute break. Then we're going to talk about, um, then there's a second part. So the first part of the data engineering pipeline is using pandas. The second part is using pandas and prefect. The third part is, is building a machine learning pipeline. And then the fourth part is doing is conducting machine learning experiments with Git and DVC. All right. Uh, sorry, the fourth part. I said I said third for some reason there, but that's the fourth part. All right. So let's come back here. So we talked about ETL pipelines as the process of moving data from many sources, transforming it, and loading it loading it into one single place. We talked about what they are, what they stand for: extract, transform, and load. That is the data engineering side of a pipeline. We talked about why should we learn how to create them. And there's three particular points that I really like here. Um, so for example, to get the most out of your data, we have uh, uh, of the data that we have in hand, we need information about the process by which the data was generated. For example, point of sale at a supermarket, think about the clicks on an online marketplace, an epidemiological study, how was that data generated? Especially now with COVID, there's so much um, data about um, health and about other things for obvious reasons. Um, then the second thing is information about the transformation that occur that occurred um, during the cleaning and merging of the process. That is crucial. Yeah. This is also one of the reasons why you should learn about pipelines. You have to, if you get, um, if some data is given to you and it, had, it has already been transformed, you could potentially, if you know about pipelines and about the process, that that they um for which they go through then you can go back and look at the code or look at the metadata or look at the at the documentation of such pipeline and understand the process by the um by which the um the data was collected transformed and loaded for example um where celsius degrees converted into fahrenheit prices in chilean pesos were converted into insert your preferred currency non-numerical and unavailable observations now contain non not available Numerical observations now contain the average value of their respective variable. Those are common operations, but we need to know that they happen. And if we don't have, if we don't understand pipelines, then it will be difficult for us to see, okay, why, um, why does, is this number in this way? Why does it say what it says here and so forth? Um, of course, the more intuitive you write those things, the better for the other person. Lastly, information about how the data was stored and where. Parquet format is a very popular one. It's a columnar database uh, format. Um, NoSQL versus um, SQL databases or relational versus non-relational databases, CSV and so forth. So understanding how the three processes described above flow will help us um, to have more knowledge about the data that we are going to use. All right, we already talked about the data professionals that use pipelines. And in particular, all of these data professionals benefit and use to some degree some sort of data pipeline. Even DevOps engineers, if they have to move logs from one place to another to compile them and then do something useful with them, they are creating a data pipeline because a log at the end of the day is also a piece of information. It's a piece of text. In essence, understanding how data flows in your organization will help you give clean data to your analysis while um, leaving the original data, the source of truth, intact. Detect inconsistencies in the original data Use the time you have to analyze and report on your findings more efficiently. 
All right, the tools that we're going to use, we're going to use Pandas, we're going to use Prefect, and we're going to use SQLite 3. Um, SQLite 3 is part of the standard library right now, so it comes with your um, normal integration of, Pan of Pandas. Prefect is a tool built on top of Dask. Um, Dask is the distributed um, parallel processing and distributed um, uh, framework in Python. Very, very amazing tool. And then Pandas is the, the workhorse of data analysis uh, for in, in Python. So let's go ahead and import all of this, um, um, all of these cells. If you have never used a Sorry about that. I thought somebody was trying to come into the session. So I um, so I clicked join and it was for me to join another session. Apologies about that. All right. Um, can everybody still see my screen? I don't think so. So can you see my screen? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, cool. Okay, awesome, perfect. All right, so if you have never used a Jupyter Notebook before, there's two ways in which you can run the cells. So when you are inside a cell, you can press the, or even if you are outside, you can press the play button at the top, but that is a very um, uh, time consuming way of running the cells. So what you wanna do is to press shift enter when you are inside a cell. So you press shift enter and then you go automatically to the next cell and essentially you get you start loading and start instantiating things as you go along cell by cell so i have run this cell three times now so you can see the number three there because it is the third time i run this all right so um now that we talked about the tools let's talk about a quick and dirty etl pipeline so we mentioned that we need to extract something we need to load, we need to transform it, and then we need to load it. So let's let's look at some real data. So these are the wildfires. So these are the wildfires um, that have occurred in the United States between 1983 and 2020. So a lot of fires have happened in the US, and then we have one, two, three, four, five, six. We have six columns. For those six, six columns, we have the year in which the fires occur how many fires occur that year. Notice this, this is ridiculous. In 1985, there were 82,000 fires in the US, wildfires. So just not things made by men, but things that just happen by nature. And this is the land that those fires cover, um, the service that it, the forest service that it cost, the DOI agencies, I completely forgot what it was, but here is the link to find out more about that, about the data set which I downloaded from Kaggle. Anyhow, and then here's the total amount of money that, that the fires cost, uh, that it costs, that of the fires. So most of the variables that we have here, as you can see, have a comma a, and a dollar sign. And those things are not things that we need. For example, if you want to add a new cell, you can go to the plus button at the top or Whenever you here right now, I am inside of the cell. If I press escape, I am outside of the cell. If I press enter, I am back inside of the cell. So if I press escape and I press the letter A or the letter B, I add new cells below and above. A for above, B for below. So if I look at the if I look at this data set, and instead of looking at the head, I look at the D types. I can see that all of those I can see that fires because he has a comma and then forest service DOI agencies in the total because they have 
um, a sign, a dollar sign, they are all objects as opposed to integers or floats. And this is something we need to deal with. So now we know, now we know where the data is. It is, it is located or it is stored as a CSV file. It has inconsistencies that we need to transform. And then we need to load it again. So we're going to use Prefect, which is the main tool that we're going to be using uh, in the second part of the tutorial to automate the pipeline. And the two APIs that this tool have, or the two most important ones, are task and float. Task is used as a decorator on top of functions and allows you to tell Prefect that that function will take part in your data pipeline via the Flow API. So the Flow API is sort of the commander, and then the task is like the minions on top of the commander telling the commander, or the commander is telling this one, okay, I'm going to run this, this one, this one, this one, and that one in that same order, and so forth. Okay, so notice here, we're going to define a function we're going to call extract. We're going to pass one argument and we're going to call it path. So that path is going to return, using that path, this function is going to return a pandas data frame. That pandas data frame is a data structure that looks like this one, kind of like a CSV file, or sorry, like kind of like a, like an Excel spreadsheet, what you will see in an, in an Excel spreadsheet. Okay. So then the next thing, as you saw above, only the last five variables have commas and the money symbol. Um, so we will create a for loop and we will replace both with an empty space. For the download process or for the loading process, we're gonna, we're gonna save the data in a parquet format. And then I mentioned earlier, the parquet format is a very, um, very famous format, not famous format, very unique kind of format and widely used nowadays because it's columnar. The difference between columnar is that it is much faster to and, and, and easier or better to save a data frame in a columnar way than it is in a row way. And let me give you the example here. So here we have a data set stored by rows. So if I wanted to just take the first column uh, of this data set, the one that has the country, then, and I wanted to take India, India, Germany, and the US, then I will still have to search through the entire data set for every single row. While as if I store my data, my data frame in a columnar way, I can just say, I want this column and I will take the entire column immediately or all of the values of the entire column that I want. So this column is called country. This one is product. This one is sales. And that's what makes Parquet so much more efficient than a regular CSV file or something else. Also, it comes with different compression um, schemes. So you can use Snappy, Gzip, um, and a couple of other ones that I cannot remember. But we'll, we can see them in just a second. So for example, here we have the second function, transform. It's going to take some data set. <clears throat> it's going to loop over every single column except for the first one. And then it's going to take that column and it's going to reassign it after taking the comma out and after taking the dollar sign out, and then it's going to return this um, column as, a, as an integer, and then it will return the data. So remember, we want to we want to process, we want to load the data, transform and return the data, and load the entire data set. So in the last step, we're going to return a parquet file, and we're going to take the data set. That, that this function is going to provide. Then we're going to provide a new path for the clean data set. And then we're going to return, we're going to save that version to that path alongside the name. So this is the example data out. And also we need to run these two functions. Remember, shift enter. So this is the example data out. And then we're using the join from the OS module. So if you notice up here, we loaded from os.path, we loaded the join function so that we can join uh, any kind of path, not just Linux and Unix. So here we are going one up, grabbing the data folder. And then we're saying in the first part for this tutorial, we want to put this in the example and we want to name this file my test parquet. So now we have the flow API. The one that we talked about earlier, if you want to learn more about the Flow API, you can go inside the function and you can press Shift-Tab and it will give you all of the information 
follow the doc string about that function and you can see everything it does so notice that we're going to instantiate this um this context manager we're going to give it a name called exam this is example in spanish um i adapted this uh, this lesson from a tutorial that i did at PyCon chile and then uh, we're going to name this uh flow in flow flow is going to contain the following three steps we're going to extract our example data in we're going to clean it with our transform data it's going to provide us back with a clean data um, variable or a clean data set containing a clean data set and then at the end we're going to pass that clean data set and give it the example out, this path right here. Oops, I did not define the extract function. Let me go back up here. Uh, I need to run this one. There you go. And then come back here. Okay, so now notice that nothing has happened. We just instantiated that and everything is saved in this item here called flow. So if we want to visualize flow, we want to see what our pipeline looks like. We can use the flow dot visualize. And notice that it was, this will provide us with a very nice um, graphical uh, form. And or um, this type of graphs are called are called directed acyclic graphs. It means that they are so in one node, we're going to have a function or a step, the link is going to be one way only. So this is extract, so this transform is never going to go back to extract, is only going to go one way. And then transform is only going to go one way. It could go to multiple places. It could not, it just cannot go back to where it came from, to where its information came from. So that is what it means to be a cyclic or directed, sorry, as directed a cyclic graph. So directed one way. And then to run our pipeline, instead of calling the visualize, also, if you wanted to save your um, your graph, you can also give it a file name as an argument to visualize, and it will save that file. Okay, to run it, then we also call, we call the run function. And now you can see that prefect is running, it extracted successfully, it was a success. Um, the extract function, the transform function was a success. The load function was a success. And then here we had a little thing about something about regex changing in the future for a future version. So it's not that something is wrong. It's just letting us know that in the future, they are going to change one of these functions. So all reference tax tasks succeeded. And we can see that it succeeded. First off, because we can go to the data folder and go to 01 and go to example. And we can see that my test.parquet was added seconds ago, which is the one that we just saved. And then to confirm, we can create a little visualization using hbplot.pandas, which is a, this is a uh, visualization library built on top of matplotlib, plotlib, and bokeh. And usually it uses bokeh for as default. And what it allows is, is that it gives pandas the ability to create interactive graphics. So here we have an interactive graphic. And notice that it gives us the, the year, 2017, and then the forest service amount. So what it costs the US, that amount of fires on that year. Notice that if we want to, if we want to, if we click on this uh, square on the right hand side, we can also search for a particular spot in the in the visualization. Oops, here it is. So we can we can zoom in and zoom out. All right. So let's talk about our case study. Um, imagine that you work as, for a data science consultancy called Beautiful Analytics. Um, your boss tells you that she has a project for you in which you will work for three governments using data on share bikes in the city of London, uh, Seoul, South Korea, and Washington, D.C. The problem that each government wants to solve is the same. They want to know how many bikes do they need to keep available in the city at every hour for the next few years. So that is a modeling problem. That is a prediction problem. In other words, 
how many bikes will be rented at every hour of the next day of the day at every hour of the day for the next few years so each government captures captures similar data but as you can imagine they all use different words and measures to um, in reference to the same variable for example one of them for temperature is still going to be temperature in another um, in another data set but that doesn't mean that both of them are going to be in celsius just like both of them might not be in, uh, in fahrenheit for example the us uses fahrenheit but london the uk uses celsius and most likely Seoul, South Korea also uses Celsius. So um, now that we know what we have, um, it means that this means that our first job before we can answer the questions above is to fix the data and put it into a more user-friendly way. So by, um, because of this, what will really help us is a lot is to automate the extraction, transformation, and loading, because if we do create a successful product for them, then we will see more data coming in the future. So we will need a pipeline as opposed to writing this every time we need it. So our first actual challenge is, notice that I put here challenge one, but there's actually a challenge zero before you get to answer the question that they ask you. And that is to create a data pipeline that extracts, transforms and loads the necessary data that we need from all three places. So this is a picture from the bikes in South Korea. So um, this is one of the systems that they have around the city in Seoul. And um, all three files contain similar information. You can see the information um, that they have in here. And this is already a clean version of all of the variables in all three places. So for example, um, London has the day, but it doesn't have the hour. Remember that our problem involves predicting the hour at which um, uh, how many bikes are going to be needed at a particular hour. So we have hour here and hour here, but we don't have a here. That means that London probably has the hour inside the day, and we're going to have to extract that. So that already gives us a bit of a nightmare. You know, we, we already have things that we need to do. If you wish to learn more about the data sets and how they were acquired and so forth, you can always click on the links that are provided in the notebook. All right. So now that we know what we have, Let's create some paths that go and grab our data. So notice the first thing. London is provided as a database. Seoul, South Korea is provided as a CSV file. Washington, D.C. is as a JSON file. So now we have three data sets with different variables with maybe different measures that we need to combine into one, into one useful product, into one useful platform. So let's go ahead and do that. If I'm missing anything up here, nope. All right, so it is um, 1.48 in, um, in Thailand. So we're going to take a quick seven-minute um, seven minute break or five. No, actually, let's do a five-minute break. And then the next one, I'll make it at 10 minutes. And the reason I want to keep them, actually, the reason I want to keep them less than 10 minutes is so that so that binder doesn't restart for you. So let's take a quick five minute break so that you can stretch your legs because um, we still have about two and a half hours. So we have quite a few paths uh, for our three data sets. And then we are also going to, if your kernel died, make sure you go to the corner. So mine died. If yours died, make sure you go to the corner where it says no kernel and click on Python 3. And then you have to you have to restart it. But what you can do is you can go to run at the top and click run selected cells or run um, run selected cells and non-advanced or run all above selected cell. And then that should get us to where we need to be. So now we're going to get this path going. And then we're also going to say, we're also going to assign a couple of new paths for the, for the data sets that we're going to be using later on. So the ones that we're going to save later on, we're going to do so, we're going to assign them right now. We're going to give them the name of Clean Parquet and then Bikes, Bikes DB if we want to use a database or if we want to use a Parquet format. Okay, so now, um, so 
now that we know that we have those three data sets, we know that we have a database, the one from London. So we need a SQLite connection to the path that we just instantiated here that goes to that goes to the data. So if you see on the left hand side, we are in the data part one and then raw. And as you can see from the raw, you can see London and then you can see London bikes underscore bikes DB. So that is where these paths are going to. And then what we're doing is we want to select all of the columns and all of the rows from a table inside this this database called UK Bikes. Then we can read it with pandas. And with pandas, we can use the SQL query where we pass that query above and the connection that we just instantiate. Now we can see the kind of information that we have. We have a timestamp, the count of bikes, as we saw above, the temperature, the humidity. So one is, I believe, one is um, the actual temperature and the other one is the feels like temperature, humidity, wind speed, weather code, and so forth. Okay, for the next one, we have Seoul. And with Seoul, we have a few, a few uh, more variables, but essentially kind of the same information, the same piece of information. Uh, but what you can tell is that we have some weird uh, characters inside the columns. So that is painful, or that is just a pain point that we have to address in our pipeline, in our transformation part. Then the last one is a JSON file, the Washington file. And then we can read it with pandas uh, read JSON. And then we also have a few more variables, but at least these ones are a little bit better because they are all lowercase and they're still intuitive and they don't have weird signs of the ones up here above. Okay, so let's talk about data pipelines with pipe. So if you have ever seen the function pipe, the function pipe allows you to take one function, one user defined function, pass it through the pipe operator with whatever arguments you need. It gets applied to the data frame and it returns the transformed data frame. I'll say that again. So I have a data frame and then I add a pipe to that data frame. In that pipe, I pass it a function, and then I get, so I got a, I got a data frame, I pipe a function, and then I get a new data frame. So the pipe does, what the pipe does is takes an object, transforms it, returns the transform object. So say, for example, we have here, we have some data, we want to change the columns, so we pass a function called change columns. Then we pass in a list of columns that we want to change it for or with, then we add another one that says clean numerical var variables Li and then the list of all numerical variables that you want to clean. Then add the dates and location, for example, to our data frames, Auckland and New Zealand. If you notice above, this one is from Washington, D.C. This one is from Seoul, South Korea, and this one is from London. But none of them tells us that they are from there. So we have to assign a new uh, column with the letter UK and with the country um, or with the country UK and with the city London. So then lastly, we fix and drop additional variables by a particular column and then with some particular um, mappings. And then that will return a clean data frame. So that's sort of the, the idea behind it. And then another way to visualize what happens in a pipe is through the following food process. So imagine we have a lot of food, but what we want is to have it neatly organized. So then the pipe operator will return the same food in a different format or transform or cook. Imagine that all these transformations are cooking the meals for which we have columns that are in a different way, shape and form, and then returning columns that have a particular meal. So that can also be um, you can also uh, translate that into machine learning and talk, when people talk about black box models, uh, pass something through a model, define some function or define some particular rules to recreate again and again in the future the same process.
Okay, so let's let's start with a, a, a small example without pipe first. So here I have postal codes. So I have postal codes, cities, and dates. And for the cities, I have Miami, Dallas, Washington. For the date, I have some dates. And then here I have some postal codes. Then I want to change the column. So I create a function called change calls. It takes the data, the data set. It takes a list of columns. It selects the attribute from that data frame. And then it provides the new list of columns. So if I say change columns, I pass in the toy data set. And then I pass in the new list of columns, of column names. Then it will return the postal codes and the city. So as you can see, with a single function, it doesn't make much sense to use the pipe. But what about if we have plenty? Then that the story changes there. So here we have the same list of columns already clean as you saw from above. So I went through the trouble of cleaning them or of putting them together in the same way in which you see them here. But they're still not clean. They're just in a more user-friendly format or in a more user-friendly way. Okay, so we're going to run this. Uh, we're going to create this list of column names. Then we're going to create a function called add dates and location. So add dates and location takes the data set, takes a city name, and takes a country. And then to using the date variable, is going to create a daytime column or a daytime object. That daytime object in, in uh, Pandas is the same as the daytime type in uh, the standard library of Python, meaning you can create dates in sort of the exact same fashion. But in this instance, this is going to be broadcasted to every single date in the, uh, in the date column. So here we are creating a date, uh, a date type column. Then we are extracting the year, the month, the week, the date, uh, the day, the day of the week, and then whether it is a weekend or a weekday. Then we are checking if the data frame columns contain the column hour, does, does not contain the column hour, then we're going to create it. If not, then leave it as, as such because it's, it already has it. We don't want to reassign an hour column um, to something that already has it because Washington DC and Seoul, South Korea do not contain the hour information in the date. So we will be assigning a zero to everything and we don't want that. Then uh, we're going to create a date type again and add it back into our data frame. We're going to add the city for which we are passing an argument and then we're going to add the country for which we are passing an argument. So notice, for example, here I'm adding a add date and location to my toy data set from above. Give it Sydney and give it Australia. I haven't run the function. Now notice what happened. All of those cities changed to Sydney. And then the dates, all of the dates, um, we extracted all, all of this information from the dates. Now notice that there's something funky here because I added city and here I had I had city already. So what it did it was was that it overwrote uh, what was in that column already, which is why here, we don't want to use, we want to check whether the data set, the data frame has the column um, called hour or not. Otherwise, we don't want to apply that operation to every single data frame. Okay, so now we have a good example. Let's instantiate um, that data frame again, but clean this time. Now we're going to apply again our transformation pipeline, but now using the pipe operator. I'm gonna I'm gonna call this one CDs. The notice here. Then now we're using the pipe operator. We have the toy data set. We're passing the column, the change my columns with a list of columns. Then add dates and location. We're passing it through the pipe, and then we get the exact same data frame. But notice that here now I change cities for Miami, Dallas, and Washington. And now we do have the city and country, Sydney and Australia. All right. So um, now that you see that the chain has um, different functions, we also have different things that we need to that we need to take care of. Sometimes we don't want uh, text values, but what we want is um, numerical values. Or sometimes we have numerical values that represent some sort um, 
some sort of information and we want to have that information and then decide later how we want to use it rather than not have it. So in this instance, we're creating a mapping with zero for spring, one for summer, two for fall, three for winter, um, or sorry, the reverse. So spring for zero, summer for one, fall for two, winter for three, one for spring. And the reason why Washington DC is different than London is just a matter of how they created these data frames. It, so, so they both have different mappings. In Washington DC, the codes start from one and up, and then from Lo in London, they start from zero and up. That's just the main difference. And then for holidays in Seoul, South Korea, we're going to use the no holiday. We're going to we're going to give it a zero, and then a holiday we're going to give it a one because there's no reason to have an actual word there if whether it was a holiday can be easily represented with a number one. Now the next thing we're going to do is remember that all three data sets don't have the same information. So we're going to we're going to take out we're going to drop all of these columns that are non consistent with all three data sets. So these are operations that are going to happen individually in each one of the data frames before we get to uh, merge them. Okay, so then we're going to call this function fix and drop fix and drop is going to take the data frame, the columns to fix the column to fix for the mapping, the mapping that we need season London season Washington DC blah 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 and then the columns to drop so notice here that we take that column that we want to fix we fix it and we take that column that we want to fix and we add it back with a new mapping and then we return the new data frame with the columns that we don't need already dropped so we're gonna so it's a simple function or it's a straightforward function that fixes a column and drops a set of columns and returns the data frame. Okay, so let's see what that what that looks like with Washington DC. So remember that with Washington DC, we still have all of these columns. This is the data set that has the most amount of columns. So we need to do a few things with it. So remember, here is change the columns for Washington DC, fix and drop, fix seasons with the seasons mapping and drop this list of columns. Let's see what that looks like. So notice how we went from all of these ones to just this set. And that's exactly what we need. We need to have, um, uh, we need to have mix, uh, matching columns in all of our data frames. Okay, so the next one is we need to normalize some data from Washington DC. And the reason is because they told us so in the, um, um in the data dictionary provided in Kaggle. so let's look at that real quick so this one is the washington dc one and if you go down in Kaggle, you will see that the temperature is is derived as temperature uh, minus the minimum over the maximum temperature minus the minimum temperature. And then and it, essentially it's normalized in Celsius. The, um, the normalized feeling of the temperature is also in Celsius. The values for the humidity are divided by 100, which is the max. Of course, 100% humidity means it's raining. Um, normalized wind speed. The values are normalized by the highest, uh, by the highest uh, speed which is 67. And if you notice, we come back to our pipeline. And essentially what we're trying to do is exactly that, denormalize them back. We're trying to take the temperature and put it back into Fahrenheit or put it back into Celsius. We're trying to take the humidity and put it back into its actual number as opposed to the normalized version. We're trying to take the wind speed and normalize it back by 67, which was the max speed. And this is only this is an operation that's only going to happen in the Washington DC data frame. Then let's create another function called extract data set for um, for our read underscore JSON uh, data set. And then notice here what we're going to do. So we're going to we're going to instantiate we're going to create a variable called Washington, and then we're going to extract the data set. We cannot use pipe on an object that is not a data frame yet. So we have to extract the data set 
and we have to have it available to be able to use Pi. Then we're going to assign from to Pi the change columns with a list of columns names that we need. Add dates and location with the two dates and location that we need: Washington D.C. and USA. Fix and drop. So we're going to use the mapping for the seasons: so winter, fall, summer, and spring. And then we're going to drop all the list of columns that are not common in all three data sets. Then lastly, we're going to use the function that we just created above, and we're going to normalize these three variables for Washington, D.C. Now notice the result from all three. So now we have a full-fledged data frame and something that we can use and um, have in common, all of the things that we need in common with all three um, with all three data frames. So so here I have a little exercise and I want you to create an extract function and then a data pipe similar to the one in Washington, DC. So the functions have already been created and they're above you. So all you need to do is create something similar to this with the functions that we just created, but for London. I'm going to give you five minutes for that. And then we will continue. And then we're almost done with this one and we are very much on time for the rest of the tutorial. The second part is a little bit longer. So we're going, we're very good on time. Okay, so let's create, let's do it together. Let's create a function that takes in extract London. And it takes in some data and a connection. And then it returns the, the data frame from a SQL query. So what we're going to do is select, so we're going to do select all from, I believe is UK bikes. Let's see. Yes, UK bikes. And then it takes, so it needs the, um, the query and the connection. And then the connection is gonna be here. So we're actually only going to pass a connection since we know what we need. Okay. So we're going to do one more thing that I haven't mentioned. When you do create, when you chain operations like this in pandas, you have to have a round bracket at the end and round bracket at the beginning. So you have to wrap that operation, that multiple line operation in two round brackets or parentheses. So here I'm going to do the exact same thing. And I'm going to do extract London. And I'm going to pass in that connection. To SQL like. Connect. London path. What just happened there? Okay, so I put this one here and we're going to put this one in the middle. So now that we have the connection, 
the extract London, we can use a pipe operator to pass in our change calls function. And then we can use the list of columns from here, which was, let's see, London calls. Then we can go to the next level of the pipe. And do pipe add or add dates and change location. And for that, we can do London. And then the UK. And now let's see how this goes. All goes well. We should have a data set with clean columns and new dates. And then this particular two. So this one's going a little bit slow for me. So what I am going to do is, let's see, restart and run up to select that cell. So I just restarted my kernel because it was giving me a few issues, but it was a little bit slow. So the resources from the resources from Binder are four CPUs, if I'm not mistaken. And about four gigs of about two gigs of RAM of memory RAM, which is not a lot. So if yours is not giving you um, any issues with the exercise, I'll also put the function in the uh, in the chat. And then I'm going to switch to my desktop for a second while it loads so that we can continue. Okay. All 
right, so let's go back to where we were. And then I'm going to do the same process. I'm going to put this one here. And I'm going to take my function. This is taking forever for me for some particular reason. But I'll come back to binder in a little bit. OK, so now notice that our function works fine, the extract London. We have new date variables, and we have all normalized variables, which is exactly what we want. Okay, so let's move now to the extract um, and transform portion of what we want to do. So um, end load portion of what we want to do. So depending on where the data is and like what kind of format is stored, which we have talked about this, um, this process of extracting can actually take quite a long time especially if it's a lot of data, if it's involving a lot of data. If it's involving a lot of data, you might want to distribute that over different nodes or clusters, especially if the data is in the same place, is in the same format, or you might want to do it in chunks. Do it at the same place, but do it in chunks. Or do it in a lazy evaluation or um, in different partitions. For example, the way in which task works is that it reads data at when it needs it, and then it partitions it, um, by a minimum size of 64 megabytes per partition. So every data set is going to have enough data to fill 64 megabytes. And then Dask operates on those 64 megabytes per, um, per data frame. Of course, you can, you can change that as you please, but um, it, it will depend on the power of your computer, of course. All right, so usually, and the reasons why, um, this might take the longest, this part of the pipeline, is because we can have so many different kinds. So for example, right now we're dealing with text. We're also dealing with JSON, with databases, but you can also have GeoJSON formats, which is, which is just one of the many types of data formats that exist for geospatial data. And then you can also have HTML and then XML, which is a pain to work with. If you have ever worked with XML, um, I, can feel, I, I can definitely feel your pain too. So since we learned already how to create useful pipelines with pandas, we now need to create functions for our main ETL pipeline. And um, to automate that process, we can achieve that using the task operator, which we saw earlier. And we notice how we, we decorate a pipeline with the operator. Then we are essentially creating an indicator of which function we want to use if we were to call the parent call flow. So now, if you want to learn more about tasks, you can also do so with the two question marks right next to the function. And then it will bring up the, um, the document, the documentation or the doc string of that function. OK, so for the first one, uh, we're going to create extract one. This one is going to extract our text file or our CSV file. Then the second one is going to extract the SQLite connection or the London connection. The third one is going to extract the JSON file. And then we go to the transform stage. And then the most common transformations that happen at this stage are usually the ones we create earlier. So in short, cleaning data, normalizing columns, converting numeric var variables uh, to the same unit, and also joining data together. So now we have one last piece of the puzzle. We have all of the functions that we need for our data frames. We know how the pipe operator works. We need to join them now. So what we're going to do first is go, we're going to take the columns of whichever data frame comes first. We're going to take the columns of one of the, sorry, we're going to take a data list, a list of three data frames. We're going to take the columns of the first data frame and we're going to re-index all three, all of the data sets by that, by that column that we pick in this step. And then we're going to sort the values by date and hour. Because remember, if we're going to do some modeling, um, in data that contains dates, we cannot split a data set um, randomly. We have to split it by dates. And we usually want to train a model or, or build an algorithm with an older part to predict a newer part. So because this is a um, time series data or a, say, uh, a data that depends on time, we're going to sort it by the date and they, then by the hour. 
And then of course, we're gonna re return the data frame. So now that we have that, then we're gonna create our transform um, function. And our transform function, notice what's happening here. This is exactly what we've, just been, what we've just been working on. We have here the London pipe, change the columns, add the dates and location, fix and drop columns. Same here in Seoul, South Korea. But then the, the difference between this, between London and this one is that in London, we're fixing the seasons one. And then in uh, Seoul, we're fixing holidays. And then in Washington, we're doing the exact same three changes as above, but we're also normalizing those columns that have different um, units, uh, Fahrenheit versus Celsius, um, normalized speed and normalized humidity. Then we're going to use the function from above. After we, after we clean all these uh, data sets, we're going to use the function from above to, um, to put them all together and to return one data frame with all three. Notice how that order, how none of these columns require a task operator, but only the one, the parent function that we're gonna call transform requires one. Okay, so lastly, we have a function for saving the data in our database, but uh, to save the data in a database. For this, Prefect provides us with a very uh, useful function called SQLite script. SQLite script takes a database or the path to a database and then allows us to pass any kind of script we want to it. So here we have a doc, um, a doc string to create a multi-line string. And then we're saying, create a table if this one doesn't exist, call it bike sharing, then add a date that is a text, a count that is an integer, temperature that is a real and so forth and so forth. So we're gonna, we're gonna tell it, create this table for us. And then we're gonna load the data set. We're gonna take a path we're gonna take the new data. We're gonna take a list of um, tuples with names for the columns and the values for each row of the column. And then we're gonna insert that data into our, our bike sharing values as values. And then we're gonna use this functionality, which, it, which it essentially says, whatever you pass and whichever, whatever kind of data you pass into this, that, into this table, is going to take the order by which you pass it. So this is for assigning order. So for example, whatever columns, whatever order we assign here, that is the order in which our data is going to be inserted into the new table. So we're going to, we're going to create a connection to that new uh, database. We're going to uh, open a cursor to execute many commands for each one of the rows and then put that data into that table. And then we're gonna close the connection. We're gonna commit the changes and close the connection. If you notice this iter tuple, tuples, that is a name tuple. It's a particular data structure from pandas. And then let me give you an example. So say um, we have here Washington. And then we want to check the iter tuples. We want to take the name tuples out of this item. So then let's take the first two. Oh, this is a, um, it becomes an irritable. So we need to use next on it to be able to see it. So notice here. we have a name tuple. A name tuple is essentially kind of like a um, JSON file, uh, so to speak, kind of like a mapping. So it has a name for the data structure called bikes for every row. And then every item in that row is a particular data type from that row or, and sorry, not just the data type, but it's the, it's the data from that row, from every single element, seasons, spring, year, 2011, month, first, hour, zero, holiday, and so forth. So when you assign all of so notice here, the date is the first one, the count is the second one, um, the temperature is the real one, humidity is the real one, blah, 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 blah. But remember that Washington is not completely, completely clean, but once it goes through the transform process, it's going to be 
in this exact um, in this exact same setup. All right. So that is the name Tobo. It's a data structure of Python. And then now we launch the um, the workflow. So we're gonna use flow as before. We're gonna call this pipeline bikes ETL. We're gonna assign it to flow. We're gonna instantiate a new table from our function here, new table. So essentially we're just creating a SQL table, a SQL light table. We're extracting all three of the, of the data sets. We are transforming them and returning one merged data frame. And then we're loading the data that we just transformed using the path, the clean DB path. So notice now the last step here, set upstream means you're only going to load the data once the table has been created. If the table hasn't been created, do not load the data. Why are we doing this? Because there's not gonna be any table to load the data at if we don't have a table. So we need to set up this job here upstream to make sure that that table is there before we get to load our data set. So we're gonna instantiate this um, or create this pipeline. So the pipeline has been created. You can see that we just ran it here. And then also we can visualize the pipeline and we can see what's about to happen. So notice extract one, Seoul, South Korea, extract two, London, extract three, Washington, transform the data set, pass the data into the load function, but do not load the function yet until you make sure that you run our SQL light script. If we don't have a database, you cannot load the, um, the, fun the data. So that is what set upstream does and the way in which it behaves. It assigns a previous step to a, to a function. Okay, so now we run our pipeline. Notice how everything just ran smoothly. So all of the reference tasks succeeded. We can check that this is the case by running a query through a, our new um, pipeline. And then by opening a connection to the path, using the, using the path to that new pipeline. So notice how now we have our clean data set. The very first part of the data set is London. We can also use the shape function. And we can see that now we have 43,553 rows and 16 columns. And before we had London, Seoul, Washington, that shape, that shape, that shape. Function task has no object shape. Okay. All done. So if we reload our data set from earlier, we can see that the addition of these three data sets amounts to 43,553. And notice how in one of them, one of them had 17, the other one had 14, the other one had 10, but because we created different columns and we also um, normalized some other columns, now we have 16 in total for all three data sets and they're all in one single place. Okay, so for the exercise, um, change the function to unload. Um, to, to use load, sorry, and to unload and make it save the results in a parquet format, run the pipeline again, and make sure that the results are the same as above by reading the data set with pandas. And um, I'm gonna help you with this one, or I'm gonna jump in with this one and help you as well. So what we're gonna do is that we're gonna take this part over here, load the data set, and then we're gonna bring it down here. 
And then what we're going to do is we're going to say return or not, not return, sorry. Um, data to arcade at and name compression. Happy. That's just one of the many compression um, styles that it has. And then, or, or actually, let's use gzip. Let's use this one. So now we have this function again. And then what we can do is copy this. Copy the flow command remove the table because we don't need it anymore and then we can remove the set up string as well because we don't need it anymore we need to use the path that we created earlier clean just clean path for the part k file the one that we created at the very beginning of the notebook and then we can go ahead and run our pipeline again and now that we have flow we can use visualize to see what the new pipeline looks like. Notice that now we don't have an additional step like before that was um, set up stream, create a SQL table before I load my data into a table within that database. So now that we have this, we can use flow that run. And notice how our call is running, but, oh, I made a, I made a misspelling there and I put completion instead of compression. There it is. But now it, it ran successfully. I had a typo there. So notice how extract one, two, one, and three all ran successfully. And then transform run successfully and then load run successfully. So flow success, all references succeeded. And now we can read with PD that read underscore parquet. We can use our clean data file, clean path. And then essentially make sure that the data set is the same. We can also check the shape to double check. And there you go, exact same amount of rows and columns. All right, lastly, um, the, last, the last step is sometimes, so we imagine that our boss tells us that the data of the three cities will be updated every Saturday. So we need to automate the interval in which we want our program to run um, so that it runs every Monday, say. So for that, we have interval schedule from prefect. So we import interval schedule from prefect, and we also import the daytime module. And what we do here is we can pass in an interval. We can pass in a minutes. We can also pass in a starting date. If you wanted to start, say, tomorrow or two days from now, or start next Saturday and run every single week and so forth. So if we wanted that to be the case, then we'll go ahead, then we will go ahead and add that interval. So now we're saying one minute. So we're gonna run the exact same uh, flow from earlier, but the one with um, our database. And what we're gonna do is that we're gonna see that it's gonna run now waiting for the next schedule, which is in one minute from now. So right now it's 6.44 to me. Um, and then, so at 6.45 is going to run again. So you'll see this running within one minute. And then this is a Python process. So you can leave this running or leave this process somewhere in the cloud or whatever. And this will just do what you needed to do until it cannot do it anymore or until it dies or until something happens to that process. But essentially, we are automating the loading of our task. And then I'm going to give it one more minute. And then I'm going to go over the summary. So 
Creating ETL pipelines helps you save time cleaning your data. Pandas Pipe helps you create chains of functions and save time and lines of code. Prefect now, um, Prefect now it saves you time um, since it chains more functions for you and helps you create schedules for your functions like we're doing here. So within one 30 more seconds or 20 more seconds, our pipeline is going to kick in again because I gave it one minute. And then no matter what type of professional you are, moving and clean data and cleaning your data is an invaluable tool that is worth knowing. So now that you see, um, notice that this is going to happen again in about 10 seconds because I gave it, I scheduled it for every minute. There you go. So it just happened again. And something happened here, but the the idea is that this flow failed. And that is the reason why this flow failed was because the latest load function that I use is actually the, um, the parquet one and not the and not the database one. So let me take this one from here and then put it into our flow. I'm going to stop this by pressing the button up there. And then if I use the parquet, the parquet one, I need to have the schedule. Notice that now um, I'm going to give it one more minute and then we'll see that it's going to um, be applied successfully within one minute. So if you have any questions, make sure to put it in the chat. Uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to go into another seven minute break and then we're going to jump in into machine learning pipelines. So it should be coming up soon at 6.48. You got an error on unstable, unable to open database file from read underscore SQL query. Okay, um, was that error? Was that error, uh, Rowan, uh, here? In in this one. In this table okay could it have been so i get an error saying unable to open database file from pd read underscore query okay um are you doing it on binder or in your computer on binder okay So the reason for that, clear workspace. Let's see if we can debug that. And also let me stop this one. Okay, so here are a couple of things that I can think might be happening. So one is, Let me go all the way to the bottom, actually. And let me run the pipeline as well. Okay. So run all above selected cells.
Okay, all of this is working, all of this is working. Working fine. Okay, so now here we are on the table. The visualize works well, but the Ron says, unable to open database file. Nice. So, oh, I see, I see, I see, I see, I see. Let's see if it is because of this. Okay, um, so this is um, this is something that Rowan that I I completely forgot when I was doing it, and I merged the and I merged the uh, gosh uh, the branch that I was working on with Master. So here is why um, the process file doesn't exist, but the folder. But if you go to data on the left, you see part one, and then you see. Um, zero one part one and then you see that there is no process so if you come up here and you create a process folder then that should work fine so i didn't i'm sorry i didn't commit this change and then that's the only thing that you're missing a process folder because it's not going to create one for you and then now if I run it again, notice that now it, it all, uh, um, the flow runs successfully. Yeah, that's, that's all it was missing, a process file over there. So that's a good catch. And then the rest should work uh, as intended. There you go. So this is, I'm in binder now. All right. So. If any other questions, I'm going to be here. I'm going to grab a glass of water and then I'm going to be right back. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put the timer for um, seven minutes this time. And then we're going to get started with machine learning pipeline. So let's take a seven minute break and I'll see you soon. I'm going to leave this right here. Hello, everyone. All right. If you can hear me, um, please give me a thumbs up. Perfect. All right, so let's continue. So now that we know how to automate it, and um, now that we have a good idea about ETL pipelines, taking data, doing some transformations on it, and loading it, let's go to the next part of our tutorial, and let's go to um, the next notebook, which is um, DVC. Before we go to that next notebook, uh, make sure you, in the kernel, you do a uh, shutdown kernel for this one, for the ETL one, because remember that we have very limited resources in, um, in Binder. I'm going to go back up here and then I'm going to open DVC pipelines or 03. All right. So now let's talk about the kinds of pipelines that we're going to be creating. So some of you might be familiar with. Um, pipelines from scikit-learn or pipelines from frameworks such as um, TensorFlow or maybe PyTorch or um, you name it. So those are some particular kinds of pipelines for um, 
for machine learning. But the one that I want to em uh, emphasize on today is a completely different one, and it's based on DVC. DVC is a tool called is for data version control. It is written in Python, and it is um, it, it essentially adds functionalities on top of uh, Git. So it allows you to do things that you have didn't couldn't do before with data or with large any kind of files really. And then on top of that, it allows you to create um, reusable pipelines uh, for machine learning workflows and the whole workflow as well from taking data, creating features, adding those new features, saving the data, creating models, saving the models, and then also differentiating from one diff or from one commit to another with the previous one, your metrics from a machine learning model. And I'm gonna de um, distill what all of that means here in just a second. So let's talk about the synopsis. Let, let's, let's go over the, the synopsis and what we're gonna call it. Um, well, essentially is, is what I just mentioned right now. Um, data venture version control is sort of the next layer or the next level of what Git is missing for data professionals. And then on top of that, we get to use, uh, we get to automate machine learning tools, or sorry, machine learning processes, pipelines, and then not just that, but also processes that are um, with more data analytics on the side as well, that are more involved with data analytics than with machine learning as well. So by the end of this tutorial, I hope that you have learned a bit more about Git for keeping track of your code, a bit of DVC to track your uh, different data sets and machine learning models, uh, a bit of ML pipelines, and a bit of modeling, and some Python tools for it. All right, so let's talk about the scenario. The scenario is very similar to the previous one, but not so in the same way because, why do I have a space so big here? Anyways, so we have sort of the same um, the same concept, but we now have only one data set. We don't have all three. We work for a company called Beautiful Analytics, and your boss comes to us and tells us they have a challenge for us to create a machine learning model that predicts the amount of bikes needed at any given hour, but just in Seoul, South Korea. So the challenge was presented to us by our boss, and um, and by to our boss by the South Korean government, and they're hoping to get later on, is a in-house analytical product that anyone can use to figure out the amount of rental bicycles needed at any given point in time in the future, at every hour. So lastly, we would like to, um, Beautiful Analytics has been improving their data science capabilities and would like for every project to use data and model version control tools. This means that we will be using DVC and all the cool tools for the first time for this task. So now let's go over the tooling in the next section. We're gonna use DVC, a tool created in Python, and it's an extension of Git. Um, it's, um, it also works for managing machine learning experiments and, a few, and quite a few other things. DVC is fantastic, and I highly recommend you to check out the company that is behind DVC, which is iterative.ai. Then um, NumPy, which you probably have uh, seen and used before, we're going to use Pandas, Scikit-Learn, XGBoost, LightGBM, CatBoost, and Git. And, Git. and um, all these uh, three tools, CatBoost, GB, LightGBM, and, and XGBoost, there are different implementations of tree-based algorithms or gradient boosting machines. And they are very, very good and widely used in the industry. So the project structure, usually, when you are working on a machine learning pipeline and a machine learning pro, uh, project that is gonna end up being as a product, you usually wanna have a particular set of uh, project structure. And uh, because you're gonna be creating modules, you're going to be creating um, new tools that might go into production or that might end up becoming a package at some point. So you wanna make sure you use proper software engineering uh, guidelines to create uh, data science products or machine learning products. And usually, say, for example, a um, project might look like this. You have a data set, uh, data folder, a process file with your train and test data, then a raw uh, file with the raw data, then you have metrics, you have models, you have notebooks, and then you have the source. The source contains your Python modules, or, or what could become what could become your Python module. 
And then you also, you got to have a readme. You got to tell people how to use your work or how to reproduce what you have. So then the next thing uh, we're going to see, oh, this picture is missing here. I wonder why. Oh, I see. It should come back here in a second. Um, anyway, so then now let's, so what we're going to do is that we're going to initialize our Git and our DVC repositories with the following commands. So before, before we get to start this, um, notice that we are in Jovian notebooks. We got to change up one directory if we want to work within this tutorial from the notebook. So our goal is to not leave this notebook, or if we do, very, very uh, rarely we leave this notebook because we want to work from here. We want to see what's happening. So what we did was is that we changed directory to one of, and then we changed to home Jovian. And then the next thing that we're going to do is, if you notice, I'm going to add one cell underneath this one, and I'm going to use um, a exclamation mark. on path nine uh on the etl pipelines yeah so um what you need to do for it to run it's not um um it's not a piece of code you just gotta add in data and i'll add this later as well so whenever you come back to binder you will see it what you need to add is just it's a folder called process with two s's so you go up here and you add process, and then all of the the last cell with the pipeline should run. That is the only thing that's missing. Oh, you mean the exercise? I'm sorry. You mean the exercise? Okay, hold on a sec. Uh, okay. Here it is. Exercise. So here's the function. And then here's the flow. Notice that at the end, I ran out of space. So you cannot kind of, you can barely see the last, the last part clean path, but that is, yeah, that should be clean path with a parenthesis or a round bracket at the end. No problem. All right. So if we use an exclamation mark, we can see, we can run bash command. So I'm going to do ls dash a to see what we have in this directory. So notice that we have a dot dvc, dot dvc ignore, dot git, uh, that git ignore and a few other things. But what we want to do is we want to we want to remove those because we want to initialize this as if we were working on this for the very first time. So I want you to uncomment this cell bash and then remove. Now we're going to get rid of all of these ones. We just got rid of all of that, and then we're going to run ls-la again. And notice how now we don't have that DVC, that DVC lock, DVC YAML, metrics, more. Well, we still have the folders, but we don't have the anything in them. So that's exactly what we need. So now we're going to do git init. We're going to initialize an empty repository. I don't know why the images are not showing, but ah, oh, it's probably because I just changed uh, folders. Let's see. Nope. Oh. All right, the images are not showing, but that should be fine. It's not. It's not a big. It's not a big deal. So now we have DVC in it, and then what DVC in it is going to do. He's going to create a few different files for us. Okay. 
So you can see that it says here, initialize DVC repository. You can now commit the changes to Git. DVC has an anonymous agreement. Check out the documentation, get help with ideas, start us on GitHub, blah, blah, blah. So anyways, this is just telling you that you can now start tracking your data. So what we're going to do is, so notice here, we have an import for three libraries, pandas, OS, and urlib that request. What we want to do is we want to, um, the data set can be downloaded from this, um, from this file. So what we want to do is we want to create a path where we join. So this is our URL. We're going to create a path so that in the data folder, in the 03 underscore part, in the row folder, we create, uh, we download the data there. So then we use urlib, that request, url retrieve, and then we get to download that data set. Now we can check that the data set was downloaded successfully with a pd underscore read CSV. If you remember correctly from, if you remember from earlier, this is the same data set we downloaded earlier. So now, um, because we want to be able to create these pipelines later on, um, we want to make sure we capture this process in one, um, in one Python file. So we want to run DVC with Python files. So I'm going to come back to the main folder at the beginning, and then I'm going to go into the RSC folder. Notice that I have a, I have a folder called full pipe. And that in full pipe, um, well, you have four files. So what you can do with those four files is that you can delete them because we're going to recreate them. So I'm going to delete all of those files there. Notice that there's nothing now. And then what I'm going to do is that those cells that we created up here to download the data and then save it, we're going to put it here. Make the import, the URL join the path. Uh, this is the file name. If this path does not exist, create it and then download the data there. So this is exactly what we're going to do. Notice that the get data just got created. And it has exactly what we gave it. Okay. And the reason so the, the way we created this is with a magic file. This is, this is called a magic function in Jupyter, and it allows us to do things within a cell. So essentially here we're saying, I want to create this file, write down this file. So this is a pattern that we will get used to in the future because we will continue doing that, write file, so that we don't leave the notebook. All right, so the next thing we're going to do, and I really want to, wonder why the images are not showing but the next thing i want you to do is to log in if you don't have a g gmail account it doesn't matter you can create one very easily but what i want you to do is to go to google drive and i'm going to go to google drive here And then in Google Drive, I want you to create a new folder. You're going to create a new folder, and then you're going to call it um, Icon APAC My Data. I'm going to create a new folder, and then now it's over, it's over there. So notice that now I have my folder. So the next thing we need to do is we need to create a folder um, and then we need to copy the alphanumeric string after the last slash. So you notice up here at the top, there's the last slash there where it says folders. And then I have an alphanumeric value or string at the top. And then I'm going to copy that. When I copy that, I'm going to go back in here and then I'm going to add 
my remote storage for DVC to that G drive. Okay. So here it says DVC remote add the dash D. We're going to talk about it here in a second, but it stands for default. And then we're going to add that a name to that storage. So where it says your drive code here, I'm going to put that code there. And then I'm going to run this cell. Now it's going to add, DBC is going to add, notice what it says. It says setting bike storage as default remote. So now we have, just like with Git, we need a remote storage. With DBC, we also need a remote storage for the data. But we need some sort of, some sort of storage, some sort of place where we can put um, our data. So now that it's setting up that bike storage as the uh, default re, um, remote, um, at some point, you will be redirected to a page so that you can allow DVC to access your folder. Add the models and the data you want with DVC add, and then from that command, run DVC push. So we're going to do that here in a second. So, um, and also, I'm, I'm not sure if in your binder you can see the, the images, but there's supposed to be quite a few images there that I don't know why they're not showing, but they are just not showing. Um, so if I open, DVC pipes here. And then I come all the way over here, then you should see where the data came from. And then you should also be able to see um what you need to check so i hope if you can see it on binder let me know um if you cannot see it it's not that big a deal um but just know that it should be able you should be able to see this um this page there and then you have to select that last part over there then when you do dvc push it's going to tell you copy this string and then give me a code and we'll do that here together in a second okay so now the next thing we're going to do is we're going to add, now we just added the remote. So the first line here says, I want to add a new remote repository. I'm going to call it my default repository. And then it's going to be called bike store storage. I'm going to, I'm going to assign it to my G drive. Okay. So the next part is that I want to add the data that I just downloaded because I, I don't want to add a data set to Git. I want to add a data set to uh, my remote storage, my Google drive. So we're going to use DVC instead of Git, DVC add data 03 bar row, so bike data, blah, 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 blah. So notice that here it says it's transferring a lot of information, um, it's caching all of that, and, um, and then it says Git add 03, blah, 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 blah. And it gives you a file that ends up with the dot csv dot dvc that means that whatever the whatever meta information metadata dvc needs about that data can go to git but the data itself has to go into a remote storage so we now need to run dvc push in our terminal so i'm gonna let's open a terminal i already have one here if you like, you can put that, you can um, take the tab of that terminal and put it underneath your notebook. So notice that here I put note, you will need to run DVC push now from the terminal. So let's do that. Let's do DVC push. Notice what's going to happen. Now Google is going to say you need to authenticate this. So I'm going to grab this link over here at the bottom. I'm going to copy it. I'm going to open a new tab, and then I'm going to paste it there. Now I'm going to choose an account. I have two. And then I'm going to give it access to my G drive because it is my own computer. It's from my computer to my account, so I will give it access. And then I'm going to copy this code. So they're going to give you something that looks like gibberish, that looks like meaningless. 
and it's just a code. So then I'm going to come back here to the terminal and then I'm going to paste that, that verification code at the bottom and where it says enter verification code and I'm going to press enter. Notice that DVC is now transferring the data to, uh, to my remote storage. So notice what's happening here. If I come back to my um, device, my, uh, my drive, now I can see that there's a file there. I'm not going to understand what the code means. DVC keeps track of that for me, for us. So it doesn't matter that it says 4E. What matters is that DVC know what data is in there and what version of that data is in there. And that's what we and, and that's all we care about, really. So now I can put my terminal back up here because I'm not gonna use it again. So now we can add, we can get at the um, the git ignore that DBC created. So uh, essentially this that DBC said you should add this stuff. And here, DVC said, let's see. No, here it says you should add this right here. So that's exactly what we're going to add. Now we're going to check the status of Git. Notice how we have a ton of stuff that we're just about to start tracking. So from DVC, from our data, and so forth. And notice how there's a ton of stuff that we have not tracked. That's fine. We don't want to track any of that. Also, whenever you come back to this tutorial, if you come back to this tutorial uh, to do it in your computer, then you should go over the actual, um, you can also do this here, but you should go, to, go over the actual Git and GitHub workflow. So I put instructions here to generate your SSH key. If you want to do it from Binder, you can actually do it from Binder. So you can uh, generate your SSH key to connect your GitHub with your binder session and your account. And then you will have to first configure uh, the global user. So all you have to do is put your GitHub email here, your name, configure the SSH key with the steps here, and then you should be good to go. But because that requires us uh, for us to go elsewhere, we're going to use Git locally in this instance only. Okay. So we're going to start tracking our changes. We're going to do git commit, and we're going to start tracking the data. Oops, we do need to use this one. Sorry. We do need to use the, um, so on comment, the bash command, and I'm going to put my email that is linked to whatever. You can use whatever here. Um, on, honestly, like, actually, you don't even need to use anything. You can just put that like that there and that's it you don't even need to put uh, your actual email you can leave that as is and notice how we are now tracking now with git we can commit and track our changes so that's good we're not going to add a remote storage and we are not going to push changes to a master version so we can forget about that because we don't need it for this instance but we're going to do the same mechanics as if we were committing changes to a remote repository in GitHub or GitLab or whatever. Okay, so let's prepare the data now. And we've already seen this from, the, from our ETL pipeline. So we're already used to this step. We're going to check the head. We know exactly what that data set has because we cleaned it before. We know what we're going to do. We're going to assign the date variable. We're going to assign it. We're going to create, we're going to create a date time object. We're going to extract a lot of information from that date time object. And then we're going to draw the, the date since we have so much of it. Oops, I need to do this one first. And hopefully yours is not as slow as mine is right now. I 
think uh, mine is a little bit um, it's a little bit slow, so I'm gonna switch to my desktop, and then I'm gonna continue. I'm gonna continue it from here, and also that way you can see the images as well. So, what I am going to get rid of. Let me start this kernel as well. Restart kernel. I'm going to shut down this kernel. Perfect. So now that I've restarted this one, let me go back to the very beginning. I am in my notebooks folder, so my Python uh, Python APAC notebooks, and I want to change up one directory. I want to use pwd. I do not want to get rid of git because that is my um, that contains my repository that everybody's using right now. And that will be bad, um, but I will get rid of everything else. And I'm gonna use, I'm not gonna use git in it, but I'm not gonna use it either. And then I'm gonna use dbc in it. Notice how now I initialize the dbc repository. I am going to get the data, but let me erase. All of these things here. Uh, no, no, not this one. Sorry, not the notebooks. The source files for full pack. I'm going to erase all of them. And then I'm going to download the data again. And then I'm going to write that file here. That is going to say get data. I'm going to erase this file, remove it, because we're going to come back to it. I wonder if it is my internet that is. Let's see. Okay, here's my data, and I am going to write this to the full pipe, uh, pipe folder, and then I'm going to call it get data. You'll see it here, get data, seconds ago. Perfect. So now I'm going to go to my folder again, and then I'm going to give it a code here. So let's see, here is my folder. Um, I'm going to take the code at the top. Then I'm going to come back to my G drive. I'm going to pass that code there, and then I'm going to run the setting bike storage as my default remote. Now I'm going to add my sole bike data. So it's checking, adding, and then it says git add raw dot dbc. Remember that DVC is a special uh, file that we upload to GitHub that doesn't contain the data, but metadata about the data and information about the data that DVC needs. So that's what we track in Git in GitHub and then in Git and then in Google Drive we track the actual data set. So now I'm going to open up the terminal again. I have it here. 
I'm going to put it down here and I'm going to do DVC push. DVC push. It's going to give me the, the same thing again, the same um, string or the same URL. I'm going to go to the URL, granted access to my folder. Okay, here it is. And then click continue. And then it's going to give me the code that I need. And I'm going to use that code. I am group W. I'm not very sure what you mean by, by that code. I'm going to paste it here, my code, and then I'm going to push my data set towards my remote. I think this one is easier. No need to Google Drive. Oh, that is the way um, use local disk for DVC. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay. I see. I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. Instead of using Google Drive, then you can. That's that's really good. Thank you for sharing that. That's awesome. Awesome. So you can use the local. Yeah. So you can use the local disk. I'm, I'm actually going to put this. Thank you. I'm going to, I'm going to put that here. So I'm going to add your suggestion right here. Now we're going to put We can also do this in your local machine with perfect. Thank you. Now I have it right here. Yeah, that's awesome. I honestly had never used it with local storage. So, I mean, I'm, I'm glad I'm learning something new. Thank you so much for that. Okay. So now, now that we have it there, what we can do is We can go ahead and start tracking our data or start tracking our files, our git ignore and our DBC, that DBC file and so forth. We can check the status of it. Of it. I'm probably going to have a ton of other stuff. Um, and then we have the config. We have the .csv.dbc, which is great. And then remember that you might need to add any kind of user to your profile. Since this is my personal computer, then I already have it. And then we can start tracking our changes, but we will not push to master. We will not push anywhere because we're going to be working from here. From um, we just need Git in our computer or in Binder. We don't need it elsewhere. So now let's prepare the data, and we know the steps already. We know that it's a little bit messy. And one of the things that we want to do here is that we want to get dummies since we're going to be training a machine learning model. We want to get dummies or this is also called one hot encoding um, in computer science terms. And then in statistics is uh, referred to as getting dummy variables. And then pandas also refers to it, to it as getting dummy variables. So as you can see here, if something is or isn't, it will be uh, pandas get dummies. We'll give it a, a new column. So is quarter end, is quarter star, false or true? So it would essentially give it zeros and ones, one for when it appears, zero for when it doesn't, or a Boolean, which is also a zero and one. Now what we're going to do is we're going to change the columns to better column names so that we have something nicer to work with. Watch this. 
you have 30 elements. Okay, let's check this out. So I have an element mismatch, and I wonder why. Let's see. Data, that columns. Rented bikes, hour, temperature, humidity, wind speed, visibility, dew point, solar radiation, yes. Rainfall, yes. Snowfall, yes. Year, month, week, day, day of the week, day of the year, is month end, is month start, is quarter end, is quarter start, is year end, is year start, seasons autumn. Uh, huh. Is quarter end is quarter end. So it's month start. Start with day of day of the year. Is month end? Yes. Is the next one. Is month start? Yes. Is the next one. Is quarter end? Is the next one. Is quarter start? Is the next one. Is year end? Is the next one. Year start. Yes. Uh, holiday. Non holiday. Okay, so there, there it is. You didn't have an error. Yeah, this is so weird. I don't know. I don't know why I'm getting an error. I am going to check if I downloaded it incorrectly earlier because I stopped it or why not. So that is so weird. Uh, okay, download this thing again. Wow, what was that for? Data 03 part raw soul data. And this should be here and it should be fine. Yep, should be there. I wonder what happened there. Uh, let me see. So that was quite that was quite interesting. The data set, and I'm sorry that I'm taking I'm I'm taking forever here, I'm trying to figure out what happened with mine because clearly it didn't happen with anyone else. So um, I can only use one DT accessor at a time. So let's see if this one, if I can come back to bind there. Oops, my kernel died.
Word combiner, yeah, I wonder. Oh, import OS. So let's see. That should work. No such file. All right. I'm very sorry about the delay. Um, I generally think it might just be my internet um, with binder and then with the downloading of the of the file, which doesn't seem doesn't seem right. But what I am going to do is okay. Let's cancel this because clearly it's just not downloading. So let's see if it is there is there and it is normal so i'm going to keep this error setting as default config by storage already exist yes um, that's already added so this is fine This should be fine as well. Sort, oops. Out of bounds, timestamp. Now, clearly the data set was downloading fine, but now it isn't. So um, how about this? Let's take, a, let's take a five minute break. Let me figure it out with my computer and then let's all be back in five minutes, okay? All right, everyone, welcome back. I figured out um, when I downloaded the data set, I stopped the download in the middle. So um, the data was corrupted and now it's all fine. I downloaded it again. It worked exactly as it was intended. So that's good. And then, okay, so now we have the columns a little bit more clean. Um, by the way, if you can hear me, can you please put a thumbs up uh, for me, please? Can you hear me? Okay, cool. I see the thumbs up. Perfect. All right. So, um, so now we have the columns. What we want to do is in, in usually in machine learning, uh, when we try to create a machine learning model, we want to um, create a model using a subset of the data and then it eva evaluate it in another. This evaluation um, data is usually called, uh, or this split is usually called train and test. Um, usually there is um, the test, you never want to see it until you're very, very sure of your model. And you want to have a validation test in between those two. So those two terms, validation and test, sometimes are used interchangeable, but they can mean three completely different sets. sets. The testing set, the validation set, where, with the one you use to build your model, and then a test set when you have nothing else to do and you're about to put that model into production uh, or do something with it, then you use it to... Um, uh, to test your results. So here what we're doing is we're taking a 30% uh, split. We're taking the length of the data minus the, the split, and then we're calling an integer. And then what we're going to do is we're going to create two paths, one for the train and one for the test. And then we're going to take the first subset, a percentage of it, for our test set, for our train uh, set, and then the, the rest of the subset, the last 30%, for the test set. And remember that our, our data set is, um, um, is actually sorted so um, because it's from date and time. So here we have now two new files. And then what we're going to do is that we're going to add these two new files, the train and the test set. And we're going to use DVC push 
to put them both into our storage because we want to keep track of them. Now, the next thing we're going to do, and let's see here, um, make sure, yep, so here are the two new files. They're coming up, they're getting uploaded. And then the next thing we, uh, we're going to do is that we want to create a file with everything that we have done. So we use pandas, we use OS, we are going to use the system uh, module as well. So what we want to do is we want to be able to pass an argument later on whenever we use DVC to create a pipeline. And that argument is going to be the raw da uh, data path. So then the raw data path is going to take that um, soul bike uh, data set and then is going to is going to essentially uh, create the training and test path uh, the training and test set for us. Then we're going to read it. We're going to do the exact same stuff. We're going to sort the values just in case, because, you know, it is a before we split, because it is a time series data, we're going to get our dummies. We're going to clean the columns, and then we're going to split the data set and save it. So we're going to put all of this into a file. And we're going to call that file in the full pipe. We are going to call it. Uh, prepare. So that's going to be our prepare step. So it's going to come up over here. There you go. There's our prepare step. And then remember, we're going to commit the changes, but we're not going to be pushing because we're working locally. So we're going to commit these changes. And now we have we have saved all of this and we're tracking all of these changes. Notice, I want to talk to you about a couple of things that have happened here since, um, or actually, I'm going to talk to you about them in a second. Um, so now we're going to train our first model. So we've done a couple of things. We've downloaded the data, we've prepared the data, uh, cleaned it and prepared it, put it, split the data into two data sets, taking into account that it's a time series data. So now we have a train and test set. The train set is the first 70% of the data um, date wise. And then the next 30% of the data is the, the next dates, the latest dates. And now we're ready to train our first model. So we want to create a random force. And what is a random force um, or a random decision force? They are an ensemble of, of learning methods for classification regression and other tasks that operate by constructing a multitude of trees and training times. And these trees are taken ran the random of it means that the columns and the rows are taken at random um, as a subset of the full data set, then they are being evaluated all the way all until the very end. And then all of the predictions from all those mini trees are used and averaged. And that is the score that you get at the very end from a random forest, at least from the regression task. And um, so we want to start with a baseline model, evaluate it, and then fine tune it. Um, either the implementation that we pick, in this case, Psyche Learn one, or as we'll see later, an implementation from another, from another framework. So we'll import SKLearn's SK random forest, and then we'll also import the Pico module from Python because we want to be able to save those models. So we're going to read in our training data set and then um, that we just saved our training data set, and then we're going to pop the rented bikes count. And the reason we're taking it out, because this is the this is the column that we want to predict. Remember, we want to predict how many bikes are going to get rented at every hour of the day in uh, Seoul, South Korea. So then we're going to create a seed, and we're going to have an estimator. A uh, number of estimators is how many trees do you want this forest to create? Usually, in practice, um, you want way more trees than that. Um, and yeah, quite a lot more. But this is just for example sake um, that we are using this few. So then we're going to uh, instantiate the regressor. We're going to give it our two parameters. And then we're going to fit the model. Fitting the model means run it 100 times, find the best parameters, and keep those parameters or coefficients, however you want to call them. And then a coefficient is a value that is sort of um, the unknown value that we're trying to fine tune. And then that unknown value is what we will multiply and what we will like later on use with new data to predict 
um, how many bikes are going to get rented at any hour. So let's do that. Um, and then we're going to use, we can check that it is predicting new values because we can use it back with the training data set and see what it will give us. And then notice that if you wanted to actually check that, you could do, you could check the rented bikes and you can see why train and then look at the 10, the first 10 as well. And then you can see the first one, I predict, we predicted 230 bikes, 231 bikes will be rented. And then the actual number was 254. We predicted 215. And then we actually got, uh, and the, the truth is uh, 204. Uh, 163, 173, that one was a little bit closer. Uh, 107, 97, that's actually quite good as well. I mean, you know, we haven't fine tuned this. This is a very base implementation. But anyways, now we have a model. That model is that RF object that we just created. So we want to save it and we want to keep track of it with DVC. Models can get quite, um, quite heavy. Um, they can actually weigh quite a lot or they can actually take quite a lot of space. So for example, if I had to take a guess, um, let's actually use a Linux command, which is du uh, dash h models. And that model that we have in that um, in, in there weighs 47 megabytes. And that's actually a relatively simple model. So as you can see, they can actually weigh quite a lot. So we don't want to, we cannot put that in GitHub. So we have to put that in DVC. So now we're going to write that file again. We're going to write our training data set, our training, um, sorry, our model training pipeline or file, Python file. And then now it's going to appear here on the left. And then we're going to start tracking it with DVC. And then we're going to push those changes immediately to our folder. And notice how it just appeared here. The newest one is this one over here. So this one is whichever it is. I think it's E9. Last mod. Oh, no, sorry, D9, because it's the last modified. So right now, we are pushing those changes up. And that one might take a second. Enable scrolling. Oh, it's almost there. Yeah, it's almost done. Okay, it's now done. So now we're gonna commit those changes and we're gonna call that training number one completed. So now the last piece of the puzzle that we wanna do. So remember, this is not foreign to us. We already went through cleaning process in the ETL pipeline. And now we created a Python file to clean our, to clean our, uh, our data. We create another Python file to download our data. And then we create another Python file to train our model. Now we need one more for evaluation. An evaluation is the most crucial part of a machine learning model. That's how you determine whether the model is actually doing what you want it to do or if it isn't. So if it is, then good for us. We created a good model and maybe it's gonna start producing value for us or our organizations. If it isn't, then we need to fine tune it and we need to figure out why. Why is it not doing this? Also, another very important thing that you should always keep in mind is the ethical implications of your model and um, if there's any personally identifiable information with your models. In this instance, all we're using is data about bicycles in a city. So we're not tying, we don't have any information that could pertain to anybody else over there in South Korea, which is fine, which is a problem that we don't have to um, deal with because it doesn't concern us, but uh, it doesn't concern our task right now. We're trying to predict bicycles, not any information about people. So anyway, so that's also something that is very important to keep in mind, the ethical implications of the data that you're using to create models. All right, so we're going to use three of the most common use, commonly used metric, metrics. One is the mean absolute, absolute error, which tells you the absolute deviation or the, uh, the absolute distance between your prediction and the, actual, and the actual value. The root mean squared error takes away the, um, it just squares the, the basically the, um, the average of the errors. Um, and it squares it so that way you don't get negative values um, and positive values canceling each other. And then R square, R square tells you how much variation in your um, 
in your predictor in the variable that you're trying to predict is caused or is um or is or can be predicted by the variation in your independent variables say the weather uh, the temperature the time the season of the year and so forth so how much variation in your predicted in your predicted variable is predicted by the in, in your dependent variable is predicted by the in the, the variation in the independent variables okay so now we're going to start doing the evaluation model and we, we want to import sk learns metrics which have a lot of useful metrics for us then we're going to import json and numpy as np then we're going to open uh, our model remember now we don't need to use the data set um, the training data set anymore because we have a data we have a model which we train with um uh which for which we got the parameters from the training uh from the training data set so we're going to load this back in and then we're going to load now the the test set so this is how we get our evaluation scores we're going to use the model with our training data on our test data to evaluate it and see how well it's doing so now we're going to get some predictions as we did earlier and then we're going to get our three scores and notice that in ms in mae in the mean absolute error and the root mean squared error the lower the number the better the lower the number the better but in r squared the higher the number the better so this means that our model explains 70 percent or 79 percent of the variation in our dependent variable by the variation in the in our independent variables so this one the higher the better this two the lower the better now we're going to save these metrics in a in a json file because dvc has a functionality or has a um, um uh, has a function called metrics that if we tell it that we are passing in a metrics it has to be in a json format and then dvc formats it for us and then we'll see how cool that is uh, later on for checking out the differences between our experiments so we're going to dump that json file with our scores and then we're going to give it a bit of format and now we have our metrics and we can actually go and see them in the metrics folder that json Okay, so it doesn't want to fetch, but whatever. Um, the JSON file should be there. All right, so now we're going to take everything we did and we're going to write a file, a Python file called evaluate.py. And then we're going to pass exactly what we did above. And then we're going to commit our changes. So the um, the metrics they can be tracked with git and not with dvc dvc uses the metrics when you tell it within a pipeline and it will use the metrics and then it will compare it between different commits but we keep the metrics uh in git because it's relatively very lightweight and it doesn't necessarily so you can see here how we are committing uh our metrics and our evaluate that pipe so now we're going to go into DVC pipelines. So DVC pipelines is like sort of one of the best features offered by DVC. Like, yes, you get to track your data. Yes, you get to track your models. Yes, you get to put them somewhere else. But also the, um, the pipelines is sort of like this amazing uh, Swiss army knife that has all these cool functionalities and all these cool things that we can use um, to like en enhance our workflow. So there are several ways for creating pipelines, but we're going to use DVC run. When you use DVC run, you have to start with an N flag followed by the name you want to give to that step of the pipeline. When we want to create, so let's go over here. Okay, so I'm at the front. So you're going to see now, whenever we create a pipeline, um, the couple of files that are going to be created. So then the next one is the D, the dash D. And the dash D is going to signal the dependencies such as the Python file that we want to run, as well as any arguments that such file takes. Next, we're going to have the O flag, which tells DVC the output expected from such a step in the pipeline. 
For example, this stage would take um, train.csv, train.csv, uh, train and test.csv. If you notice in the file that we just submitted, that we just uh, wrote to evaluate that pipe, you can see that the model file is a sys uh, argument. So we're gonna pass in an argument and then that argument number one, and then that argument number two, the first one is gonna be the model. The second one is gonna be the test file. Where is this test file at? We need it in order to run, or we need the, um, the folder in order to run our test uh, that CSV or to load our test CSV file. So that D is gonna be dependencies. Those are gonna be those arguments that we're gonna pass on our pipeline, through our pipeline. And then the O is, okay, what is this supposed to output? So this is supposed to output a um, JSON file. The previous one is supposed to, out, is supposed to output a training, um, a model in this one. This one we're supposed to pick up a model. So that's exactly what we tell it, what we tell DVC with the dash O. And then um, lastly, you need to pass the full Python call without any flags. So after we run this, we're gonna get two files, a dvc.yaml and a dvc.log. The dvc.yaml file is sort of the step, the stages of our pipeline. So technically the, the next logical question is, okay, can we just write the YAML file as opposed to using DVC run? And yes, you can. And I'm gonna show you that here in a second. And then you have the other one, which is DVC log. DVC log is sort of the one that contains um, all of the information that is not very human friendly readable that DVC needs on the background to support your pipeline. Lastly, when you wanna reproduce a pipeline, you use DVC repro. And we're gonna walk through all of that right now. So right now, um, if I were to have a dvc.log and dvc.yaml, which I assume you will have it in, um, in Binder because, because it was there uh, when I, um, the last commit that I did for this tutorial. So I, I will remove it just to show you these steps. And then because I, you can see on the left that I don't have them, then that's okay, I'm not gonna run that. Then I'm also going to remove all of the .dvc files that I've been tracking so far, even the model, just for example's sake, um, and to be able to reproduce my pipeline here. So I'm gonna remove all of this. Now that I removed it, I can start running. So remember, we start with the N, we give our process, our step of the pipeline, we give it a name, we're gonna call it get data. Then we pass the dependencies of this which is the full pipe get data file. So we need our, py our Python file, that is a dependency. The output of this uh, particular path is the raw um, data set, the sole byte data. And then we pass lastly, the, the full Python code. So Python run get data, okay? So when we create this, remember, we're gonna create two files. And then those two files are DVC, you're gonna see them here on the left, DVC YAML, which notice was notice was going to happen. It's going to say stages. It's going to give us the the first name of our stage. Get data. The command, which is Python run get data. The dependencies, which are just the Python file, of course. And then the output is the data set. And notice that the data set contains the path. And that's something that we need. Then the next one is DVC log, which is the one that I mentioned that is less human readable. So notice how here it says schema two stages, get data, command, we understand that one, path, we understand that one, but then MD5, whatever that is, 314, whatever that is, path, uh, MD5 size. So it's like less human readable, but it's still kind of like, you can still understand what is happening. Okay, so now that we know that we created those two files, we know that we could actually like copy this and just start writing it manually, but we don't want to do that manually. That's just a lot of work. So let's continue on and then let's add the next stage of our pipeline. So notice how it said running stage, get data, Python, SRC, get data, creating DVC YAML, adding stage, get data in DVC YAML, generating log file, updating log file, DVC log. Track the changes with the code below but we're not gonna do that just yet. What we wanna do is we're gonna run all of the, re the rest of the ones that we need. So we're gonna run the prepare stage. We need as a dependency, the full Python file, and then we need the, the data set. Remember that we passed that sys.artv so that we could pass a, uh, an argument in the command line. We're gonna use the dash O because 
the prepare generates a training and a testing data set. And then we're gonna um, and then we're gonna pass it our full Python command. And we're gonna run this, and then it's gonna update our uh, both of our files, DVC log and DVC YAML. Notice how it says here: adding stage prepare in DVC YAML, updating log files, and then it gives us again some more files that we could that we could track with Git. We're gonna do the same for train. We take the the Python file, we take the train data, the output is the pickle. Uh, model, and then we put the full Python command at the very end. Lastly, and this is very important, this last one, um, is the evaluate. And the evaluate, um, what it takes in this one is, it takes the same, it takes dependencies, and notice that the dependency is still the Python file, now the model, and also the process data, or the process folder where um, it's going to deposit the, um, or no, not, not going to deposit, sorry, where it's going to get the, um, the data set, the testing data set from the process files. Now, notice the new, the new one that we have. We have here dash M, and this dash M tells DVC to treat the output of that particular stage as a metric so that we can later use DVC div and then compare the metrics between one div and another which is something very important, something what we need. And then at the end, as usual, we put the full, um, the full Python command. So now that we have this, we can actually um, check our DVC YAML and then see what those stages look like. And then the log, the DVC.log is gonna look similar. So notice that we could have written this by hand, but we definitely don't want to, we don't wanna do that. We wanna let the command line do it for us and then not worry about any of that. So now that we have our full pipeline, we can check out the DVC, we can check out the DVC status, the status of our pipeline. And it says data and pipeline are up to date, which is exactly what we want. Now we can show the metrics of our model. Notice how cool is this? We can see with DVC, with just one thing, we can just see the metrics. Mean absolute error, 191, um, root mean squared error, 290, and then R squared 78 um, or 79, if you want to round it off. Now, the other cool thing that we can see, just like just as we saw the direct acyclic graphs in the previous um, pipeline that we created in the ETL pipeline, we can also see the DAG with DVC DAG and see what is happening here. So notice that earlier we had one, two, three, four, five. We had three extract, one transform, and one load, and one upstream dependency for our ETL pipeline. Now we have a full ETL pipeline within two, within two steps, get data and prepare. And actually, if you think about it, it's just prepare because get data wasn't part of, the, of, the, of our ETL pipeline, only the uh, extract, preparation, transformation, and loading. So essentially we have our ETL pipeline in this step and with DBC, we have extended what we can do with that entire pipeline. So much so that now we can train and also we can evaluate our models. Okay, so in order to rerun our pipeline again, we can use DVC repro and um, remove, we can, we can also remove DVC lock and the data files and run DVC repro once. And the reason for this is that if we do so, um, we can see how DVC um, acts with all of the other tools. So for example, right now it says stage get data didn't change, so skip, prepare, skip, train, skip, evaluate, skip. What this means is that DVC caches, um, that keeps track of what it has run, and then it also caches information. So if you only change the evaluate section or you only change the train section, that is the only one and the ones after that one that are going to change. The previous one, these two are not going to change. And that is by design. I think it's a really cool feature of it. So if we were to remove all of these ones, say for example, the data process, and, um, and actually, I'm not going to mess with the, um, well, actually, I feel like I need to because, uh, because I'm taking out the lock. But um, yeah, let's remove it all. Okay, so now I just removed everything and I can do DVC repro again, and then it will get the data and it will generate the DVC log and it will give me everything back. 
Now I can do DVC push. And now it's transferring that pipeline towards our folder over here in the 4E. So it pushed uh, our pipeline, which is great. It's exactly what we needed or the things that we're tracking in our pipeline. And now we can check our Git status and see the things that we could that we could move. So notice, remember that the data set will never go into GitHub. So that's what they end with that DVC. This will not go into GitHub. This will not go into GitHub. This will not go into GitHub. This will go into GitHub. This will go into GitHub as well. So now we can add everything and commit. And then we can check the Git status. And now we're good. Nothing to merge. Okay, so now let's talk about experiments. And we're almost, uh, we're getting close to the um, to the time. But um, so is we're gonna be we're gonna be very good on time. We're gonna we're gonna be uh, we're gonna be good uh, right on time. Okay, so now say okay, so we have a good model with Psyche Learn. It's better than random. It explains 79, 78, 79 percent of the variation of our model. Um, it's it's pretty decent, but there are other frameworks that are known for that being their sole purpose, creating random forests for regression and classification, namely XGBoost, LightGBM, and CatBoost. So what if we wanted to experiment with all of these and also at the same time check uh, whether one is better with the previous commit? So remember that this... Um, that our metrics here, they are part of a commit. So notice how here we use DBC metrics show. This is part of a commit. So if we change the model or the framework and we get different metrics, how would that compare with the previous one? Let's check that out. So what we're gonna do is that we're gonna write this file and then everything we're gonna change. So remember, we are all we are changing here is the X, XGBRF regressor so the XGBoost XG regressor. And then here we are instantiating the same. Notice that the parameters are the same. So we're gonna keep everything the same and we're gonna comp compare frameworks. This is our experiment. We're comparing frameworks, not necessarily fine tuning processes of different kinds of uh, implementations of around random forest. So we're gonna add this and then we're gonna check the DVC status. Notice that it tells you the train stage changed and then, so we updated this file. Then we can use DBC repro again to reproduce that pipeline. And notice how it caches the files in the previous one, get data and prepare it and change. So it's not gonna rerun anything that it doesn't need to. So it's gonna save you time. Then it updated the dbc.log and, um, and now, and, and it also rerun the metrics. So now we can check the status of our pipeline again we can see that the pipelines are up to date. And then if we do DVC push, we are pushing now the new model. So it should be a new model here, B8. So one file got pushed, so that's great. Now, this is one of the coolest things. So now we can see the metrics from this new one, but not only can we see the metrics from this new one, we can also see the comparison from this one with the old one with the previous commit so this was the old commit we got a we got a mean absolute error of 191 so we were wrong by 191 bikes per hour it, with the root mean squared error we were wrong by 290 but it says here that this model is explained 70 percent of the variation the variation in the bikes which still yet to be proved but we haven't tweaked anything we're just comparing frameworks right now this is our experiment and then in the new one, it got way worse with um, XGBoost. But also XGBoost, you have to use way more, um, way more ensembles uh, or way more estimators. Sorry, 100 is nothing to get anything good from it. I'm not saying that that's going to be the only thing that is going to improve this model, but we're just comparing frameworks right now. Who, which framework gives us the best off the shelf uh, without much implementation scores. So that's what we're looking for. So now let's commit our changes and then let's change another one. Notice here, I want you to notice something before we move on. Here, I was changing um, branches 
but I said I thought that that was a lot that was that's a bit too complex if we're not going to be using GitHub. So you can come back to the tutorial and use it on your laptop and then do the checkout yourself. And then at the end, you know, you're going to have a pull request uh, waiting for you for the best one, for the one that you want the best. And there's also an image at the bottom on how to do that. So now we're going to commit those changes and we're going to say we were testing XGBoost. And then notice here that I added a new branch, experiment two, light GBM. So that's exactly what we're going to do. Light GBM is a framework created by Microsoft and is very, very good. It uses a different kind of um, implementations of uh, random forest and gradient boosting machine. And, um, and so those cat boost and so those XG boost. So what we're changing here is essentially just the, just the framework. And then we're uh, writing out the train file. We're checking the status. DBC is going to tell us that the pipeline changed, the train pipeline changed again. We're going to reproduce our pipeline. Notice how it's running the, it's in the running stage, and then it's going to go to the evaluation stage and so forth. Perfect. Now we're going to push those changes. And then we're going to compare uh, with the previous one. So notice that from XGBoost to LightGBM, we got way better results than before. Much better, even better results than with um, uh, than with uh, Scikit-Learn, but and even and even better with the R square. So the base implementation of LightGBM is better than Scikit-Learn and is better than um, than XGBoost. So now let's. Um, let's commit those changes for testing live GBM, and then let's check for our last um, uh, for our last step. Let's check ca uh, cat boost. So we're going to use cat boost regressor. We're going to put it over here. We're going to use the exact same estimators, and then we're going to check the status of our pipeline. It definitely changed. We're running that. We're pushing the changes, and let's see what happens with the metrics. So LightGBM was the first, was the best one. So let's see this one. So notice that um, the old one is 188 and um, the new one is 191. So pretty much the same, give or take. But then in the technically in the in the root mean squared error, we got a slightly better score. And then also R square is slightly better. So XGBoost had a um, 78. Both of these have 80% 80, um, 80 in the R square. And then for the root mean square error, um, which is the, the metric that I would prefer, but I mean, I, you, I track as many as I can if I'm running an experiment, um, is about five, the difference. So this one is almost nothing. So anyways, so that's just to say, if you were running this and you were running it using um, different um, different branches in Git and GitHub, this is what will happen next. You will determine which one is the best one, which one you want to use to continue on, and then you will go to GitHub and you will say, well, I'm going to merge this PR and I'm going to merge. So for example, if I, I like cat boost, so I will merge exp3 cat boost, and then I will continue working. And then, so, so, what is a, so what is a PR? What is a pull request? So a pull request is sort of, it's, it's a user-friendly, um, web interface for discussing proposed changes before integrating them into the official project. You're working on a project. Um, there is a master branch. There is a branch. There is something that goes to the world that puts your application out there and it shows it to people and it allows people to interact with whatever, whatever service you provide. When you uh, want to create a new feature, you branch off that piece of uh, application or your main application. You branch off that application, and then you work on that feature. When you revise it, when you test it, when you polish it, you submit a pull request um, that your colleagues can see. You get code review, you get, um, and that, that is essentially reviewed by somebody else. If they give you the green light and they give you good feedback and they say, hey, this is a great application, has been well tested and whatnot, and then you push those changes, you merge those changes with master, and then that goes into production. And depending on the company, and if it's a model, it might be a face recognition system, it might be a predictive system, it might be whatever uh, you like.
It might be anything that will go into production and then it will start making predictions for something. So that essentially is a pull request. So if you come back to the tutorial, um, the steps are detailed here for you to do so. You can see here how you can compare uh, report, uh, CML report. That is another tool from iterative.ai that I didn't cover here, but it's very, very good. And I highly recommend that you check it out. The steps are minimal to set it up in a way in which you can do this with GitHub and through Git. So these are just all the steps that we cover and then how you will merge a pull request. Then at the end, you got to make sure you do Git pull DBC, and DBC pull with the model that you want to get for the data, the code that you want to keep, that you want to work from, and the data and the model or, or the model that you want to use. So uh, perfect timing. In summary, as you have seen throughout the tutorial, DBC can help us uh, track our data, models, and metrics, and it also allows us to create pipelines for getting, preparing, and modeling the data. DBC fills up the gap of what Git alone cannot do for the machine learning community, so this tool should be in everybody's data scientist, in every data scientist and every machine learning engineer's toolkit, at least to um, for experiment search or for saving large data sets in a remote repository without having to pay any money. So, um, or, of course, it depends if it's a cloud provider, then you might have to pay a lot. But for example, with Google Cloud, uh, with Google Drive, we have um, uh, free 15 gigs of storage, which is quite enough to do some good stuff. So anyways, um, that's, um, there were some blind spots about this tutorial. So for, for example, we could have fine-tuned fine the base, the best base model even further to make better comparisons with other frameworks. We could have done the same thing with the other frameworks as well. We could have conducted more feature engineering. We could have selected the best features only based on feature importance. So right now, all of these models are using all of this information that they don't need. So remember, we haven't pruned the features. Right now, we have two columns, one for holiday and another one for no holiday. There's no need to have those two things having the same, um, the same information. We also have um the seasons of the year we have four columns for the seasons of the year we don't need four columns for those seasons of the year because um the fact that is either summer spring or winter means that the one if those three are zero if those three columns are zero it means that it must be um the fall or autumn so uh, we don't need that fifth column or that fourth column so there's a lot of stuff in our data set that we could have done much better. But this is um, the purpose of this tutorial is to teach you how to create pipeline, not to teach you how to fine tune models or how to tune hyper, yeah, how to tune hyperparameters, how to go and do and build the best uh, feature engineering, feature selection system ever. It's just to teach you how to create a pipeline so that you can then go and build your, pro your projects um, using these tools and then automate the process of your project and your tools. So lastly, uh, we could have done a bit more analysis of the data, uh, some visualizations and whatnot. And then we could have taken out the second domain category of variables, just like I just mentioned, um, for future work. If the data will be provided in the same format uh, we received it, then we need an easier transformation pipeline for the date, column names, and domains. So for example, making them explicit functions as opposed to the processing step that I just made them be. So for example, if we, would have, we could have combined our ETL pipeline from the beginning with this step and our uh, modeling would have been much more robust or our pipeline would have been more, much more robust. Also, another thing that I haven't mentioned that, we've, that we don't have here is test. We need unit tests. If we're going to build a system that is going to provide predictions for someone, we need to make sure that when changes happen, those changes um, obey a set of rules or follow, no, obey is not the right word, follow a set of rules that we know will not break our system and you know produce chaos with our client or something like that and lastly we could add the analytical tool or dashboard to the master branch and work with the model solely through branches if we wanted to so say for example a little dashboard that shows that has a couple of widgets and shows hey if you move with this model if you look for this particular date this is how many you're going to have something to make it useful uh, for our users or for our customers to interact with those models. And um, yeah, that is um, that is this session. That completes this session. So if you have any questions for me, 
um, please let me know. Like we are literally right on time. Um, three hours, three and a half hours for the session. So let me know if you have any questions. Um, yeah, make sure you come back to this and I hope you found it useful. Um, my email should be somewhere there, I believe. And I'm also in the Slack group, so. I'll put my email in the chat if you have any questions. Please let me know. Thank you very much for coming, everyone. It has been a pleasure. If you have questions, reach me on Slack, um, send me a message. And um, yeah, I look forward to the rest of the conference. Thank you very much. All right, then. So I'm going to stop sharing now.